This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Previously on The Wild. Ready, Cap? Born and raised. Stop! Python! I thought that there was room for another apex predator in the Everglades, and now look at me. I was, couldn't have been more wrong. Do you ever get anyone in here asking for snakes that are illegal to, to sell? Um, once a week, every week, probably. <laughs> I used to hold them. They didn't bother me. They're amazing creatures, aren't they? I challenge you even to go to Everglades National Park and find a single squirrel, raccoon, fox, possum, deer. That's what we're going to be left with if we do nothing. I'm back in South Florida, in the Everglades, on the edge of a dirt road next to a canal. It looks pretty similar to where I met Anthony Flanagan and Kevin Pavlidis, the two python bounty hunters. Out in front of me are miles and miles of marshland. Today, we're diving back into the Burmese python problem, but this time, we're doing something a little different. Okay, here she comes. Oh, that's her head, right at the entrance to the bag, coming out straight away. Oh, she's beautiful. We're letting the pythons go. It's incredible, because you can actually see her lungs exhaling in the middle of her body as she's letting this hiss out. That's amazing. She's got this really white underside all checkered patterns on there and then this beautiful mottled dark brown and light tan colors across her back all in the shapes of squares and circles and a design you really couldn't make up it's the most exquisite looking animal she lies there for a second incredibly still and then oh she just struck at lucy she lunges at my producer lucy yeah, they can strike wow. about a third or so, fourth. Lucy, I've never seen so never seen you move so quick. That's good. That was amazing. After dramatically showing us what she's capable of, she slowly makes her way towards the canal, and then slithers out of sight. She's just gone into the water, oh, like a serpent. That is one of the most mind blowing things I've ever seen. With the focus being the urgent removal of Burmese pythons from the Everglades, it might seem counterintuitive that we're now releasing one back into the ecosystem that it's destroying. But there's a good reason why. This snake will lead researchers towards all sorts of important information to try and save this ecosystem from an impending ecological collapse. From KURW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. When an invasive species enters an ecosystem, it can have massively detrimental effects to native animals living there. According to the National Wildlife Federation, over 40%, that's 40 40% of threatened or endangered species across the world are at risk simply due to invasive species being where they shouldn't be. In South Florida, the Burmese pythons are eating just about everything when it comes to native mammals. Most of the raccoon, opossum, rabbit, fox, and even bobcat populations have dropped dramatically. Yes, bobcat claws have been found inside pythons. So I've come to meet the researchers who are trying to learn more about these giant snakes. Dr. Melissa Miller and Sam Smith are biologists from the University of Florida. They're using radio telemetry to keep track of the pythons by inserting tracking devices into their bodies and then letting them go back into the Everglades. Wait, is this your truck? Uh, that's my truck. This is Sam. And that's where the, the, the goodies are? Yeah, they're in the back seat. They're hissing the whole way here. In the back seat. Really? Yeah. They're, the they're in boxes, but <laughs> they're not just like hanging out in there. In the back of Sam's truck are two big black containers, like super strong totes. 
They're double locked with padlocks and marked with huge words. Dangerous, prohibited reptiles. That's where the snakes are kept on their drive to the release site. Before we head out, Sam cools the snake down by pouring some water from her water bottle into the little holes in the lid of the crate. A little bit of water for the cause. These big snakes are semi-aquatic after all. You can hear her hissing as she deeply exhales. We hop in the car to drive to where she'll be released. One of the main goals of Sam and Melissa's research is to learn about how the pythons are using their environment. If you look out across the vast expanse of the Everglades, it might seem like it's all just marshy wetland for miles and miles. But inside of that ecosystem, there are actually tons of different types of habitats. Tree islands, sawgrass, marsh, cattails, levees, canals. The Burmese pythons move between all of these different habitats year round. So Melissa and Sam are trying to figure out where they are at what times of the year. And they can use that information for targeted removal efforts of the pythons to try and get on top of the invasion. Python habitat is something that Sam knows a lot about, not only about their habitats here in Florida, but about their native homeland too. She did her master's degree on them in Thailand. I tracked my snakes every single day, even weekends, Um, so I had a really good idea of what they were doing there. She made an interesting discovery about where the pythons like to spend their time. I worked within a, a biosphere reserve, And so in the core area, you have several different forest types. And then on the outskirts, you have like an agricultural matrix. What I found was these Burmese pythons were actually using the agricultural matrix more than the forest. The snakes largely stuck to places with rice paddy fields and irrigation canals, places that seem pretty similar to the habitats in the Everglades. Being there and then being here, it makes sense to me, you know, why they do so well here. They love dense vegetation, not a lot of canopy cover, shallow water, and the Everglades just happens to be perfect habitat for these huge constrictors, even better than their native home. Ironically, in their their native range, they're, they're a species of conservation concern. This is Melissa, the other biologist from the University of Florida. So if the snakes are of conservation concern where they came from, why not just ship them all back? My first question would be, who's paying for that? She says the problem is that the pythons came here from several different countries, like Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam, each with their own localized genes that you wouldn't want to be mixing. So taking them back to Southeast Asia could introduce new pathogens and put resident pythons there in danger. Often people think like, oh, well, let's just fix it. You know what I mean? Like humans can fix it. You know, oh, if we ruin the water, if we ruin the air, like we can just fix it. Some things you can't fix. But with the telemetry program, Melissa and Sam hope the information they're learning will bring them one step closer to tackling the problem. Back in the truck, Melissa prepares us for releasing the hissing python they've brought. It's 16 feet long and not very happy. This snake is uh, is pretty pretty feisty. This is one that we got from a contractor and it had actually eaten a six foot alligator and uh, regurgitated it um, the next morning so it had I mean a giant giant lump in it you could see like where the the alligator's limbs were folded back um, because they eat the animal head first that is insane I just we have pictures too we've got pictures too I thought it was a different snake but yeah Sam was just the alligator she ate was a native species one that the bounty hunters and these scientists are trying to protect They measured the gaiter after the snake regurgitated it, six feet long and 44 pounds. The Burmese python is upending the food pyramid here in the Everglades, totally disrupting the typical order of operations. It's through a phenomenon ecologists call a trophic cascade. In the Everglades, the typical food pyramid works like this. Alligators are at the top, and they eat what's under them. 
Anything from medium-sized mammals like deer and bobcat to smaller mammals like rodents, mice and rabbits. But when the Burmese pythons entered the ecosystem, they started eating animals from bottom to top, decimating the lower levels of the food pyramid and disrupting the natural order. They've wiped out the mid-sized mammals. They've eaten lots of the larger mammals too, like the bobcats and deer. And they've even preyed upon the larger predators, like the American alligators. The problem is that when a small link in this food chain is broken, the impacts can have ripple effects that are felt across the ecosystem. Researchers don't yet know how the Everglades food pyramid will rebound and make up for the loss of roles played by all these different missing animals. But one thing's clear. One layer of that food pyramid is now almost completely gone. We pull up to the spot where we're going to release the snake. It's a long levee right next to the highway with a canal on the other side of it. Melissa and Sam try to release the snakes in the same exact places where they were captured. Snakes have an amazing ability to, like if you released it somewhere far away from where it was captured, it, a snake will typically try to get back to where it was captured. And so, so this snake knows this, this neck of the woods, as yep, it were? this is the area where the contractor captured it. We lift the container with the python out of the truck and Sam opens up the padlocks and there's a tan bag inside. As she unties the bag, I can see a few inches of stitches running along the snake's body. This incision here, she's been, uh, what? Uh-huh. Is that, is that? The, um, so the tags, the, the uh, radio uh, telemetry tags that were put in the python, each, each snake gets two and that's the uh, incisions from, from where that happened. The tags are shaped like cylinders with antennae, each a bit bigger than a AA battery. And on the outside of the incision is a pink label to let the bounty hunters know this snake needs to be left in the wild. It's a tricky thing, though, because right now, Melissa and Sam are doing the opposite of what their goal is. Their goal is to get as many pythons out of the Everglades as possible. And now, here they are, releasing one. Honestly, like, when you release a snake, it there comes with it a a burden of making sure you're conveying the message of why like the contractors caught the snake typically they're euthanized and then a lot of the public for example have issues with like why are you releasing it again you know so it's it's on the researchers to, to make sure that message is getting out there of like the data that can be gathered from the snake melissa and sam have asked me to help today and as a snake lover i'm only too happy Sam has told me to be quick before the snake strikes, so I grab her neck with my hand right behind her huge head. It's the size of a big burrito. Oh, shall I lift her out? Yeah, yeah, so you can grab that coil. Wow. We lift her yeah. body, and she's immediately coiling around my legs. Sam hoists the heavy middle section. That is like arm wrestling a very strong person. And we manage to place her down on the grass. We step away quickly to avoid being bitten. They're not venomous, but apparently their bite doesn't leave just holes, but a big bruise too. She calms right down, and it gives me a chance to really admire her. i just kind of overwhelmed and uh, honoured to see a creature like this and to be able to touch it and see it, and it's not its native habitat, but it's where it's calling home. Is uh, It's really hard to describe. I mean, it's slithering around like like some mythical creature right now, you know, just like those that you see in the storybooks. You can still hear her hissing. She's about 10 feet away now. She instinctively moves through the sparse grass towards the thicker vegetation of the Everglades Marsh. And without hesitation, she's at the water's edge. One more 16-foot slither, and she disappears into a waist-deep swamp. She's probably going to, uh, to go over there and, and lay low for a little bit, having just gone through the surgery and uh, the capture and release and all of that. So, so yeah, we'll have uh, the first data point on her tomorrow. I can tell Melissa feels conflicted about seeing the python being released. It's a beautiful animal, and, and it's not its fault that it's here. So it's kind of a shame um, what happens to a lot of the ones we, we capture, but cool to see some getting released and, and increasing the knowledge we know about the species. Mm-hmm. So. 
I can see you have mixed emotions about it. Yeah, I mean, because we, we get into this because we like snakes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you don't want to... You don't want to have to, to euthanize uh, any animals, especially not a, a beautiful animal like Burmese pythons. Um, so it is it is hard, but there's a, a bigger picture at hand with the, the Everglades ecosystem, and you know it's it's the card we're dealt, and and we're trying to, to help the, the ecosystem as, as a whole. The female we've released joins other scout snakes, as they call them. They could be the key to a window into their lives that wasn't available before, leading researchers to more and more pythons and the prey bases that they're consuming. Researchers have even now taken to radio tagging prey species like raccoons and opossums so they can find the pythons that eat them. But it's not only the food pyramid that the pythons are affecting. There's another major impact that rode in on the pythons when they came from Southeast Asia. They have two little sets of hooks on either side of their of their mouth, and they can actually tunnel uh, within the host so they can cause infections. It's a lung parasite from Southeast Asia. It's about three and a half inches long, a little crustacean-shaped organism. Melissa has found it in 13 native snake species. In one case, over 200 miles away from the northernmost infected Burmese python. And now she says that almost one third of all native snake species in South Florida, including some rare ones, have this parasite. It highlights how a species that's not supposed to be here, whether it's a 20 foot snake or a three inch parasite, can cause havoc for those species that haven't co-evolved with it. So that leads us to the big question. How was the Burmese python introduced to the Everglades in the first place? We'll have that answer after the break. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. It's late afternoon. I'm driving along the highway in Florida's West Palm Beach, and all of a sudden... I spot a big sign pinned on a fence at the side of the road. Reptile Expo. Right there, in big, bold, black and white letters. I'm never one to pass up a spontaneous opportunity like this. West Palm Beach, on the 5th of February. So, change of plan, we're going to the Reptile Expo. (laughs) I can't believe my luck. The annual Reptilian Nation Expo is today. It's a convention where people come to buy exotic reptiles. A huge part of the python problem began with people having them as pets, so I'm keen to see it with my own eyes. I walk into this giant building. It's as big as an aircraft hangar, 50,000 square feet, filled to the brim with stands and vendors, all selling different types of snakes. Little cartons and crates and containers everywhere with live snakes in them. This is... (laughs) This is crazy big business. I see a vendor in the middle of the room with a sign, Marty's Morphs. A table piled high with over 150 little square containers, each one with a coiled snake inside of it. Can you tell me about your collection? I mean, I've never been to anything like this. It's blowing my mind. I just can't believe there's rows and rows of snakes. These these are all ball pythons. They're all the same species, but just different color mutations and uh, pattern morphs. Marty and Kim Penny have been breeding snakes for over 30 years. They specialize in selling snakes with a variety of unusual and rare skin markings. They breed carefully selected individual snakes for just the right outcome. Each is unique, with a new intricate pattern never seen before. And they can get pretty pricey. I mean, you see some of these snakes here for five, four, five thousand dollars. I've paid. Oh my goodness, this one here is $4,000. I've paid as much as $17,000 for one snake. 
Ever since 2010, it's been illegal for breeders like Martin Kim to breed and sell Burmese pythons. So there aren't any Burmese here at this expo. But Marty tells me he used to breed them. They imported those things years and years and years ago. Uh, when I had them, it was back in the early 80s. Um, so, I mean, they've been around for a long time. I had females that have uh, laid 60 to 70 eggs. So, what is it about these snakes that captures you or, or people? What do you think? It's, it's amazing what can be created. This is actually um, what they call living art. Because you've got so many genes to work with. You get so many different color combinations. You get so many different pattern combinations to work with. And it's an addiction. Burmese pythons first came to Florida from Southeast Asia through the exotic pet trade in the 70s. Over the next few decades, it became a huge industry, a multi-billion dollar business. It's estimated that nearly 100,000 pythons were imported into the United States from the 90s to the early 2000s. And because of its subtropical location, Miami was a hotspot. And it wasn't just Burmese pythons that made their way to Florida this way. A total of 35 non-native snakes came here from other countries through the pet trade and have since been found in the wild. But it's the Burmese python that's the most destructive. And here was the problem. A three-foot pet Burmese python might be okay, but what happens when they get to six feet, eight feet, 15 feet? Well, people just let them go, or they escaped. I asked another expo vendor about this, Andrea Kochel. It doesn't surprise her that people would let them go. I feel like, especially in Florida's climate, where we kind of have that more, you know, subtropical climate, people just assume, oh, it's warm, it's hot, it's humid, it can live outside, I don't want to take care of it anymore, and just let it go. They really don't understand the implications that happen when these animals do actually survive and actually are able to breed, and the impacts are just so severe. And on top of all of this, a hurricane. Back in August of 1992, Hurricane Andrew swept across Florida. A Category 5 storm that trashed everything in its path, including a python breeding facility. Out the snakes slithered, into the Everglades, only too happy to make this warm, marshy wetland full of food their new home. I'm back with Melissa Miller and Sam Smith, the two biologists from the University of Florida, because once snakes are released, the task of tracking them begins. We're going to head into the swamp to locate a big python they released a couple of months ago. Sam sets me up with the telemetry gear. It's a long antenna that I hold up to the sky while she drives along the levees. I lift the receiver to my ear. As the beep gets louder, it means the python is closer. We got one. There's the snake. Wow. Sam slows down the truck, and we use a system called triangulation, driving back and forth, pointing the antenna into the marsh to figure out where the signal is coming from. See where that first little bend in the road is? I think, like, just there, maybe a bit further back is where the first beat came in. Okay. And then I was really sure by here, so, yeah. yeah. We pull up to the spot at the edge of the marsh. Miles and miles of sawgrass swamp in front of us. The animals out here are pretty different from those I know in the Pacific Northwest, so I have to ask, what do I need to know? What's going to uh, bite or snag or coil around us? Any, uh, <laughs> anything to be aware of? There are cotton mouse, venomous snakes, uh, water moccasins also, they all the same thing. Huh. Uh, there could be some gators. Um, so we're okay, and, so yeah. only alligators <laughs> and venomous moccasins. Yeah. Snakes. Oh wait, and, and the sawgrass is sharp. Okay, so, so nothing to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just and that and if we're successful, we're going to see a big python. <laughs> so, oh, and that's got the animal No danger rescue. there either. So. <laughs> we walk along the edge of the levee, and Sam chooses a gap in the tall vegetation for us to enter the marsh. We need to get within 10 feet of the snake for Sam to plot it on a map. They only have home ranges of about half a square mile, so every foot of accuracy helps. 
Even better if we can actually eyeball the python. Sam goes first with her radio receiver. All right, right behind you, Sam. This is where we leave dry ground. I step in and immediately my legs sink into deep mud and water up to my waist. It feels a little mad to even be in here. A swamp full of alligators and giant snakes. And then every step is tricky to lift your foot out of once you've placed it. Oh my goodness. It smells earthy like tree bark. It's because there are hundreds of years of decaying plant matter that I'm disturbing under the water that's surfacing in air bubbles. Oh yeah, that's a deep hole. Yeah. It's very slow going. I'm trying to grab onto something, anything, to keep my balance. But the only thing around is sawgrass. Oh my goodness, and the sawgrass is really sharp. You run your hand down it the wrong way and it cuts you. Is this normal, Sam, this deep, this, this kind of going as you, when you're tracking them? Yeah, really? yeah this is a bit shallower than... Um, this is shallower? Well, a little bit. So... Sam's got the receiver to her ear right now. It's up there, arm's length, and the snake is somewhere ahead. We don't know quite where, but it's up there somewhere, and it is unbelievable. I can hardly see the hand in front of my face through these reeds. We're getting closer. Getting close there. I think you said that 20 minutes ago. Sam and Melissa do this kind of telemetry tracking year-round, but there is special information they can gather right now, during February, because it's breeding season. When a female python starts nesting, she stays with her eggs for two or three months. They can track when and where she started nesting, how many eggs she has, and how long she stays with them. Reproductive information that's key to controlling a creature that can have a hundred youngsters at a time. How does it make you feel being in here? I mean, it's definitely a little bit nerve-wracking. Uh-huh. In terms of what? Why? I mean, you've just got things like gators out here. Um, I would just hate to put my foot in like a gator hole or something like that. What is a gator hole? Uh, so they'll like kind of burrow under. Um, I think they can go pretty deep. Good to know. Gators pick places to dig under and create large holes, pockets that can hold water during the dry season. I'm wondering how close the nearest alligator might be. Have you ever run into one out here? Uh, no, not yet. So hopefully today's not the day. But turns out, today is the day. What? What? We hear a gator. And it's growling at us. The alligator sounds like it's only about 10 feet away, right between us and the python, defending its territory. It's making a sound called bellowing. I catch it faintly on my recorder. It's not, it's not common for them to bellow. Typically, they'll just take off <laughs> silently. So this one seems a bit aggressive. So What's the, what's the uh, issue? What could happen? Oh, well, you know, if he's not happy that we're here, could charge us. Um, but they're also great swimmers, so, you know, they could <laughs> come through the water as well, of course. Sam sounds very chilled, but I can see she's nervous. An aggressive alligator is not to be taken lightly. They attack about 10 people per year in Florida. These living dinosaurs are very fast and very hard to see. We're so close to the snake, but we're running out of daylight, and alligators are nocturnal. But judging from my signal, the snake's very close, so whether or not we see him, but I still get a pretty good data point. In other words, time to head back. Sam and Melissa say it's just not worth the risk. The wet slog back to the truck begins, following the GPS route every step of the way. There you are. Cool. 
It's ironic that the native species this team is trying to save is the one that aggressively pushes us out of the swamp. There are so many ups and downs in this everyday fight for Sam and Melissa, but big things are at stake. The Burmese python problem in the Everglades is one very vivid example of the devastation an invasive species can have on an ecosystem, and how difficult it is to collect information about those impacts. I really like the, the quote, I think it's attributed to Joe Podgard, uh, and it's, the Everglades is a test, and if we pass, we may get to keep the planet. It's taken millions of dollars and tons of people out here every day to solve what seems like a losing battle. I've got to say, um, who cares, you know? What about those people that just say, why don't you just let nature take its course and leave the snakes alone? Because <laughs> it's not nature taking its course. <laughs> this isn't nature, so these snakes would have never got here on their own. Um, and it's it's ultimately due to humans, and you know it's it's kind of you have a a duty as a, as a human to you know to to try to do something to protect the the Everglades. I mean, it's I can't just not do anything about it. Is this something that is a losing battle, or or is it worth fighting for with these Burmese pythons? With the current control tools we have on hand. Um, we've removed quite a few snakes. I believe there's over 17,000 from the state that's been removed. But as far as eradication with the current tools we have, no. They're in the interior of the Everglades, so we can remove a whole bunch from, from the levees. But ultimately, in the interior of the Everglades, we're not doing anything. And, and it is challenging. You saw when we were walking out there today. You know what I mean? It's not easy to find a, a python. And, just think how long it took us to go such a short distance just to go through that marsh. Yeah. And, and you know, we were looking for one python. Like and then you, you look out to the horizon yeah. and it's endless yeah. Everglades. You right. Know, and we covered a few hundred yards. It's just insane to think about them all out there. Uh, so right now, I mean, eradication of pythons completely from Florida is is not feasible. But But if you give up, then what? Melissa said it first, eradication is not a solution. It's just not possible at this point. It's too late. But the hope is that someday something will work as the fight continues to prevent things from getting worse. I'm reminded of a small stand back at the Reptile Expo. It was over in the corner of the room, one of the only vendors without stacks of containers filled with snakes for sale. The sign on the table read South Florida Herpetological Society and the people at that stand were not there to sell, they were there to educate. Educate everyone about the risks of buying an exotic pet to show just how big large constrictors like the Burmese pythons can get and to teach what's happening to the Everglades right now as a result of the exotic pet trade. It's said that invasive species the world over may be as damaging to native species and ecosystems as habitat loss and destruction. Whether it's foxes eating marsupials in Australia, cane toads munching their way across the Caribbean, or, dare I say it, English ivy taking over a Pacific Northwest forest, invasive species are a force to be reckoned with for today's conservationists, and for all of us. You never know what you might unleash from a plant seed on your hiking boot to a voracious predator from your aquarium. Every species comes from somewhere, but they don't belong everywhere in our intricate world of ecosystems. If you enjoyed the audio experience of this incredible Python story, guess what? We have some great film content too. Behind the scenes clips, 
and a short film that we're producing with Paul Bikus. You'll see us in action in the field, releasing the 16-foot python, and even the moment we have the run-in with the alligator. So fun. There's a link in our show notes where you can go to learn more. And we've got even more photos and clips of the Everglades on our Instagram at The Wild Pod and mine at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. The Wild is a production of KURW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Lucy Suchek and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Alan Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stallman, and Annie Mize. Our production team includes Paul Bikus, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Ginotti Boyle, Tatiana Latre, Kara McDermott, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. If you enjoy The Wild, maybe share it with a friend or leave a review. It really makes a difference. We're out to inspire as many people as possible. Thanks so much for listening.